Hello everyone, welcome. Um, <laughs> this is uh, Modern Fraud Detection uh, Prevention Using Deep Learning. Um, that title was submitted quite a long time ago, um, so I'd say actually the talk is probably a bit more about machine learning in general now. Um, we had a, a, a good talk earlier on in the day introducing some of the, the concepts behind learning, and I'm hoping to sort of build on them really. So this talk is, is, is going to be a bit more technical. Um, there's, there's no maths, which you'll be glad to hear. There's, there's also no code. I've tried to you know, explain myself using diagrams and pictures wherever I can. Um, but it is a much more technical talk, so hopefully you can get your, your teeth into it. Um, we've got the usual slides at the front saying, please rate and engage. Um, so yeah, my name's Phil. Um, I'm with Trifork, but we're in, in Trifork Leeds, so we're, we're quite distinct from the, the, uh, the Danish mothership. Um, I, uh, I actually am a, I'm a software engineer in my, in my professional life. Um, machine learning is a, just a bit more of a hobby. Uh, I'm currently working on the, an Apache Mesos framework for Elasticsearch. Um, yeah, if you'd, if you'd like to talk more about any of the subjects that I'm about to discuss, then please see me or, or see some of my colleagues listed at the bottom there. I'm going to skip the marketing slides because you all know Trifoc. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've split it into three or four um, topics. The, 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 the final one, the architectures, um, that is, is more about how we would do this in production, how we would do this in real life. Um, it's, it's interesting, but it's not really the core thing of my, my, my talk. So I'm going to go through the, th the first three sections, and if we have time, I might do the fourth. Um, but I'll probably end up speaking for too long, and I'll probably drop that section. Um, I'm going to introduce the, the reasons why we want to provide some new tools and techniques to apply to fraud, um, to try and make the case to, to business users as why you should pick up on some of these ideas and start to run with them. I'm going to then introduce the topic of machine learning. And you've probably had quite a bit of experience already. But if you haven't, that, that'll be the section that really explains what's going on and, and why it happens. Uh, and I've also got quite a lot of demos as well. Um, some of the demos are, are, are quite simple and very general, just to explain the concepts. Um, but the rest of the demos are all focused towards fraud prevention, focused towards finance, and specifically mortgages. Okay, so let's crack on. Um, so in order to, to do any of this work, we need to persuade some people to give us some money. And there's no better reason to get people to give us some money if there's other money at risk. Um, in the UK, we've got some UK-specific facts here. In the UK, financial crime is defined as... I can't even read that screen, so I'm going to have to read from here, sorry. Um, fraud is an act of deception intended for personal gain or to cause a loss to another party. So all of these facts and figures are, are, are specific to the UK, but they're, they're applicable to pretty much every country in the world. Um, anybody that's trying to, to do wrong or to do harm for their own financial gain um, is considered fraud. We've got a uh, UK mortgage fraud listed there. In 2014, there were 1.2 million uh, properties bought and sold in the UK. Um, and 83 in every 10,000 of those applications were fraudulent. So that's not quite 1%, 0.83%. And when, we say, when you say fraud in that, that aspect, it's not necessarily people being like hugely devious. We're going from the small scale where somebody's maybe telling a few fibs about their employment history or how much they earn, all the way up to huge, huge, you know, international fraud. In 2013, there was a, a, a story of two guys who um, had invented there a whole series of companies that invented estate agents, that invented surveyors, that invented property uh, businesses and builders, and they had supposedly bought a huge tract of land which they were going to build you know, lots of new houses on. They then invented or stole the identities of other people to take out mortgages on those prospective houses. So it turns out there were tens, you know, tens to hundreds of mortgage applications all going in for houses that hadn't been built yet. But as it turned out, they just took that money, paid off the original land, the original debt that they owed on the land, and then just legged it. They just ran off. They completely invented a village bought loads of mortgages based upon that, and then ran off. 
Uh, how, how can that even... So the, the total cost finally came to... It was about £53 million pounds they managed to, to run away with. And they did finally get caught, but they, they very nearly got away with it because it was just so embarrassing. You know, the mortgage companies were so embarrassed to say that this had happened, it almost never even got caught. So um, it, does, it does get to quite a large scale. And um, this, this actually equates to approximately £1 billion pounds worth of fraudulent applications. So it's a huge, huge number. Um, but my, uh, interestingly, it's not actually the worst case of fraud in the UK. The worst is actually credit, uh, current account fraud. So traditionally, what, would, what people would do is to steal somebody's information, open a standard bank account, current account of some sort, um, from, a, from a, a traditional bank, which you can do quite easily in the UK, and then use the overdraft or use some facilities to actually withdraw some money and then, and then run, up, run off. Um, so that actually constitutes the most fraud in the UK, but we're, we're, we're talking a little bit about mortgages today. Um, and finally, we've got UK real t uh, retail fraud. M much of the business in the UK is actually made up of small to medium, medium size enterprise. The, the, the big guys actually don't, they make a significant part of the market, but not a, not a huge part. Um, small to me medium sized businesses, they're estimated at losing 18 billion pounds every year to fraudulent transactions. So that's when somebody goes online, uh, buys some clothes or buys some food or buys some shopping of, of, of some kind uh, on a credit card and then maybe they cancel the credit card as soon as they place the order. So the, the, the guys on the retail side of having to ship all of this stuff only to find that the person you know, doesn't exist or the card was stolen or stuff like that. And that amounts to a huge amount as well. Another reason why businesses might want to look at some of these ideas is that legislation, so we've got one end of the spectrum where there's people actually doing wrong to their businesses, so you might want to try and protect yourself, but also there's legislation, legal requirements that need to be put in place in order to comply to law. Um, in 2017, there's new anti-money laundering legislation coming in within the EU, so it applies to all EU countries. Um, it's extending, extending money laundering rules that are already in place. But the main changes are that the out of scope limit um, has dropped to 1,000 euros. So previously it was 15,000 euros. Um, and this applies to businesses that are handling financial transactions. So it applies to uh, banks, obviously, financial institutions, credit agencies, stuff like that. Um, it also applies to uh, legal services and estate services. Um, it also applies to, to gambling services. Basically, anybody that's handling and moving money around has to comply with this legislation. And what this is saying is that anybody that has a transaction of over a thousand euros, they need to prove to the authorities that they're doing their due diligence in, uh, to prove that that person is A, not being fraudulent, and B, not using the money for nefarious means like terrorism or something like that. And finally, the, uh, uh, they're required to submit their information to a central registry of information. Um, and this, there's, well, there's obviously privacy concerns there, but it, that's a bit unclear on how that's actually going to be implemented. So there's financial reasons, direct financial reasons why you, want, might, you might want to do it. There's also legal reasons. So how do we do it at the moment? Well, if a traditional company was go to, would go to a, a software house, uh, and ask for some software to do this, they would probably come up with these, some combination of these four general ideas. We've got the origination-based technique. So um, most countries have a law that requires financial services to prove that they're talking to the real person. Um, origination is, it, that's, is, that's what origination is. Um, I <laughs> one, one thing I get really, really annoyed about is, is banks in the UK, they've got this awful technique of using automated phone systems to try and prove you are who you say you are. So you go through the whole series of, you know, please type in your ID number, please type in your address, please type in your password, please do this, please do that. And that takes about three and a half minutes. And then as soon as you finally speak to a real person, which is all, all you wanted to do in the first place, as soon as you speak to a real person, they ask all the same questions again. And it turns out they do this because these businesses aren't quite sure that the automated method really is proof enough that the personal methods are actually going to override. So, yeah, th it really does my head in. Um, and some, some maybe less secure uh, instances, such as like, insurance agencies and 
um, people that are not necessarily as interested in protecting security. They can use some really quite dodgy methods, like I've had some cases where people have asked me just for my date of birth or just for my postcode or something like that, and they're completely not secure. Your date of birth is basically a password you were given at birth, you can't change, it's fixed, and you have to live with it. So it's, it's the worst password that, that can ever exist. The next group of uh, uh, technologies are rules-based. So these are uh, static rules that are usually provided by analysts saying that you know, no transaction must be bigger than X, or you can't have so many transactions within a, a certain period of time, something like that. Um, and, they're, and they're great, and they're okay, and they, they catch a reasonable amount of fraud. Um, it's usually the, the accidental types um, and the, uh, the basically the not so intelligent fraudsters would try and do something silly like this. Um, but also, it, you, you also catch all the good guys as well, like, like when you're abroad. You, you, your cards always decline the first time because they, they think it's fraudulent. Or, you know, when you're trying to buy uh, a new car from a guy and he, he only takes cash and you try and pull out 1,500 pounds out of the cash machine, you can't do it because it's, you know, it's against their static rules. Credit checks, so lots of agencies will gladly accept your money to provide you with a number. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and these numbers are supposed to represent the worthiness or the, the, the risk that that person um, provides to your business. And there, there, there's certainly a case, there's, there's an argument to use them. How accurate they are is uh, an, another question. Um, Aggregation and monitoring. So this is more of a, a, a reactive type of uh, uh, solution where analysts would be provided with the data and they you know, perform some query or are ask a question and try and do something based upon that. So for example, um, you can have some guys that find a, a pattern between you know, one cash machine, for example, gave out a large amount of money. So the analyst will then say, check it out. So they're the types of things that exist in the wild at the moment. Um, but now I'm going to start talking about machine learning and how we can use machine learning to improve some of those technologies uh, and try and remove some of the bias or the redundancy or the error out of those technologies. Okay, so uh, following on from our uh, excellent presentation this morning, um, I've forgotten her first name, Miss Pitt, sorry if you're here. Um, she was talking about how we learn um, I, I also have a couple of slides, but it's not <laughs> it's, uh, it's a bit more basic. I like to introduce my, my daughter here. She's, she's 18 months old, and she's currently going through this process of learning. And it's really fascinating to watch how she does this, because there's, there's lots of parallels between this and between the state of machine learning algorithms at the moment. And if we can understand how, how we learn, it actually helps us to write better algorithms. And it helps you to understand the algorithms as well. So this is my daughter with her. Her mother, my wife, making some yummy rice crispy, crispy chocolate square things. And um, in the top picture there, she's doing exactly what Mum told her. Please take the rice krispies and put them in some baskets, and then we can eat them later on. But somewhere along the line, she decided to perform some test. She decided, if I put this thing in my mouth, is it going to be good or is it going to be bad? So she put it in her mouth, and it was good. So she completely ignored any instructions from then on, because she'd learned that eating chocolate with Rice Krispies was a good thing. So that's a, a, a very simple example of, of how children learn and how algorithms learn in general. You, you provide them with some test, with some input, and then they evaluate that input and decide on some outcome. Um, it takes time, however. So she, she's 18 months, and she, she's still pretty stupid. You know, she, she can't worry. <laughs> she's struggling to put sentences together. She, she can, when she walks, she falls flat on her face. Um, she gets spatulas and misses her mouth and hits her eye, and it's, it's not good. So it does take time for this to happen. This applies to, to algorithms as well. They take time to learn. Um, we've got this great game that she loves, which are, are index cards. And this is an example of how she gets things wrong. I mean, she's, I, I, she's very good. I, I, yeah, she's really good. I don't want to <laughs> give you the impression that I'm a bad father and I'm saying she's rubbish and get rid of her. But no, she's very good. But in some cases, she does get it wrong. The first example on the left there is a door. However, she thinks it's a house, and she thinks it's a house because it's got four walls, and it's got these features in the middle which are like squares, which kind of look like windows. But what she hasn't learned yet is that a house actually needs a triangle on the top. And so this is, a <laughs> this is an example of a misuse of features. So there are features there, but she's misusing them to come to the wrong conclusion. 
The second one, she calls this a chicken because she doesn't quite understand the concept of a bird. I think she, she, she struggles to, to, to understand classes of things. She's quite happy to learn that that thing is definitely a bird and that thing is definitely a teddy and that thing is definitely mummy and that thing is, is dad when he's around. Um, but uh, she, she struggles with things, so that's a chicken, so that's, uh, that's okay, but that's just an example of a misclassification. Um, and then finally, we've got the third picture, and apparently, that's a tiger. Now, I, she, when, I, when I show her this card, she kind of looks at me and goes, mm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that is, and then I look at the card and go, mm, I'm not sure what that is either. I, I, I think <laughs> sometimes she goes for a cat, sometimes she goes for a bear, Sometimes I don't know. I don't even know what it is. It looks like something's sort of ran over it. It's like a cat that's been ran over, basically. Um, and that's a great example of just bad data. So in real life, you will get bad data, and there's a big cleaning method that's required to try and prevent you from getting this bad data because you will come to the wrong result. So just to prove that it's not just her age, I've got an example for all of you. So take a look at this picture, and I'm just going to watch you for a second. Right, so, so for all the programmers out there, this is like a human equivalent of like a stack overflow. So what you start doing is you try and focus in on her eyes, but then you realize that she's got eyes in a different place, so you, you kind of jump across, and then you realize the mouth is in the wrong place, so you jump again, and you're up and down and up and down, and if you stare at it long enough, you start to feel sick. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, but, but all this is proving is that you've learned some specific things over time. You have you know, decades worth of experience to say what a face would, should look like. And when it doesn't look like that, you don't quite know how to process it. Um, and we can get it wrong. You know? Humans are completely infallible. Uh, fallible, sorry. <laughs> wrong choice of words there. Completely fallible. OK. So moving on to the more technical topics here. Um, machine learning comprises of four-ish sort of distinct components. They're all trying to do slightly separate different things. The first item is, is dimensionality reduction. So when we think of data, it has a number of dimensions. And by dimensions, I, I basically mean like a single point of information. So if you imagine a 10 by 10 uh, grayscale picture, that has like 100 dimensions. There's 100 pixels in there, which all represent a distinct piece of data. The problem with that is that with images, it's OK, but for ma many other types of data, it's really hard to try and visualize what's going on. So you've got to compress that space down into two or three dimensions in order to actually see what's going on. So that's the act of dimensionality reduction. We've got clustering, where we're trying to um, assign an output to a certain class. So quite often, we know what class it should belong to, or at least we should know um, how many classes there are, at least. So clustering is the process of trying to group things together into distinct classes. We've got classification, which is linked to clustering, where that's more asking the question, exactly where do I put the line to say that's class A and that's class B? Uh, and finally, regression, which is trying to predict a value based upon the previous inputs. We've also got different types of learning as well. Learning is the key thing that's, that's really enabled deep learning to, to come to the forefront, is that the new training techniques that have been developed are so much more powerful than they were in the past. Um, training can be split into supervised and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is where you have an expected result, so it's, you say it's labeled. So you say that this raw data is supposed to belong to class A. Uh, this is supposed to be the number one, or this person is fraudulent. Um, the algorithm is then trained, the parameters of the algorithm are then tuned to try and uh, produce that same result. And the, 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 the measure of performance for that algorithm is compared to the, the true result versus the uh, predicted result. Um, and then when you uh, were to use this in, in real life, if you had new data coming in, then you would use those pre-learned weights and you would uh, predict an output based upon that. For unsupervised, you've got no result, so you don't know exactly what class it's supposed to belong to. Um, algorithms are trained in that you need to decide on, on what's going to um, provide you with a, a measure of how good your algorithms be trained. So some, some of them are deciding whether data are close or far away, so it's this measure of distance between data. Um, there's also maybe other reasons why you want to do it as well, and you can provide your own. We're talking about um, uh, 
customized or personalized customized uh, 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 functions to actually cost whether your output is going to be labeled as class one or class two if something is important. Um, but in the, real, in the real world, most data is, is usually semi-supervised. You, you usually start off with some labeled data and usually a, a, a lot more that is unlabeled. So you can kind of combine these two things together to maybe you can use the labeled stuff to start to bring out some of the clusters and then apply the unlabeled data to you know, really fill in the pattern a bit more. So let's talk about some specific algorithms. I'm going to talk about two. Um, Every, every guy's got his own favorite algorithm. Um, this first one is uh, called a decision tree. And there's various different types of decision tree, but we're going to stick to the simple one for now. And they can be used for classification and regression. And the idea is that they predict the target of uh, uh, the target value of a class or a value or something based upon some very simple decision rules. So is it less than 10 or bigger than 10? Is it is it label A or label B? Um, the example we've got there on the right is quite morbid, actually. This is a decision tree that's been learned from the data provided from the Titanic manifests. And this is predicting whether you're going to survive if you were on the Titanic or not. Um, so the first question it asks is, is the sex male? So if it was yes, then it goes down the one side of the tree on the left. If it was no, it goes down the right side of the tree. So if you were female, you had a pretty good chance of uh, 0 0.73, so 73% chance of surviving. And that represents 36% of the entire population inside the, the Titanic. Whereas if you were male, and if you were above 9.5, then you've got a fairly big chance that you're going to die, unfortunately. 61% of all males over 9.5 died. Um, and you can see that you can go down the tree and you can make a decision based upon these rules. So the idea of the algorithm is to train these parameters, these rules, these decision points, to optimally make the, the right decision. So it's conceptually quite simple. It can handle categorical data, which is great because some algorithms can't. But it, well, decision trees specifically um, can overfit quite badly, but there are lots of methods to, to use decision trees in a different way to prevent the overfitting, so don't worry about that too much. Um, decision trees are, uh, are usually one of the simplest and uh, sometimes effective enough to solve a problem. The next algorithm, and what's surrounded by lots of hype at the moment, is deep learning. So deep learning is, uh, is, is really good because it, we remember those uh, classes of types of uh, algorithms at the start there. It actually does all of them. It does the dimensionality reduction, the classification, the regression, and the clustering. It could do all of it. It's a holy grail of algorithms. No other algorithm can actually do all the same things. Um, the idea is that it's actually trying to model our learning process and our brain, basically. It attempts to model the neurons and the synapses in your brain to do the similar sort of task. Um, it's, it's simplified somewhat, but uh, that's, that's the general idea. So the hope is that if we can produce a model that, of our brain, that then we can write, write algorithms to perform things that our brain can do quite easily, like recognition, classification, things like that. Um, so the pros and cons, again, uh, it's very versatile. It can be used for lots of different tasks. Um, the, the, the key improvement, really, is that it begins to remove the requirement of feature engineering. So with all of the other algorithms, your algorithm will live or die based upon what features you give the input. You need to work really hard with other algorithms to, to say that this is the most important feature. I'm going to keep that and use that. But those other ones are completely redundant. I'm going to remove them. And that takes a significant amount of time. With deep learning, it has the ability of internally, during the training stage, of either completely removing parameters or or completely keeping parameters, purely based upon how well it fits the data, how well the training process goes. So it removes the bias that comes from removing data or adding data that you're not sure it should be there or not. Um, the, the, the main con, well actually, I suppose there's a couple of cons. The biggest one is it can be hard to visualize. As soon as you start getting into neural network sizes that are quite deep, it can be quite hard to visualize and conceptualize. Um, I'm hopefully going to try and prove that wrong in a little bit. But um, that's, that's uh, the problem number one. And problem number two can be quite computationally expensive. But that's, that's true for kind of lots of these algorithms, really. 
So how do they actually work? Well, it, they all, it, it works primarily by trying to conceptualize things. So um, there's this idea that, uh, that neural networks are acting like a, a hierarchy of, of uh, concepts. And the, the whole goal really is to take those images or to take your data and produce a concept, something that accurately describes what is provided at the input. So we've got the couple of uh, the concepts on the on the left there. We've got a street, an animal, and a and a person. But you can see that you don't you the 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 two the bottom ones, the person and the animal. They're they're actually linked by another concept. You know, they're they're both animals. There's just one of them's human. So the 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 great thing about the the layering concept is that you can actually start to tag things that are similar but not quite the same based upon your training data. So to be more specific, this uh, is, is a, uh, an example of uh, uh, how you would go about conceptualizing an image. So each pixel within that image, that's the hash lines there, that would be passed into the input of our deep learning, and it would start to produce concepts around those pixels. So the first layer might decide that there's a you know part of a tire or a part of a rim or a, an end plate or something like that. Usually very small, discrete kind of local things within the image. The next layer might start to build on that concept and build the concept of a tire or a, a full wing or a rear wing. And then finally we get to the, the classification. And in this case it's an F1 car. But you can imagine that if you then showed the algorithm a normal car, it could reuse some of those concepts. They, all, they still have wheels, they, they still have you know, cockpits or, or bodies or whatever. Probably don't have wings, I don't know. Maybe, maybe in Leeds, I don't, don't know about Denmark. Um, but uh, you can reuse some of these concepts, and that kind of shows the applicability to not just, not just problems that it's already seen, but also future problems that it hasn't seen. And so just to finish this section off, really, just machine learning in the news, or deep learning in the, in the news, um, the, the one I really like that's accessible to, to anybody, really, is the, Google, the new Google Translate app that takes pictures of signs or text in a different language. And it translates that text, but the real, the cool USP of the whole thing is that it actually takes the image and replaces the image with the correct uh, text in your language. So here we've got a Russian sign, and uh, it's replaced it with the, the, the English here. Actually, I say, it says access to city, but according to uh, uh, my friend who, who speaks Russian, it actually means exit to village. So not access to city exit to village, but it's not quite as grandiose if, you showed a, if Google showed a sign saying exit to village, so it's probably why they changed it. Um, and then we've, we've got the, the image at the bottom, and this is a, a new chip developed by IBM. It's been a few years in the making, actually, um, but effectively it's a, 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 a deep learning neural network type uh, infrastructure inside a chip. So obviously you've got the cores and you're used to the cores. Imagine the cores parallelized massively. So instead of having you know, one core, we've got tens of thousands. In this case, there's actually a million. There's a, a million neurons in this chip. So it's able to do a million uh, uh, parallel tasks all at the same time. And when we go through, through some of the examples in, in a minute, we're going to be talking about like image sizes to like the 10, 10 by 10, 100 input pixels that go down to maybe two. Uh, two two outputs on the uh, two dimensions on the output, so that's kind of nothing in comparison to what this could do, and this is actually in hardware as well. So it's super fast, super low power, and should produce some really interesting applications. Okay, so it's just to solidify the how how deep learning works, I'm going to take you through a, an example, which is uh, uh, a description of some, uh, some numbers here. So the, the idea of this task is to um, recognize some handwritten digits and to classify them as a, a number from 0 to 9. So it's a really classic uh, machine learning example, but it's really great to use an example as an example because it's very easy to understand, very, very easy for everybody to understand. It's just trying to recognize what that number is. And the first thing we notice when we start looking at the data, so the first step in any, in any data analysis job is to have a look at the data. And the first thing we notice is that if you actually, if you look at that, that top left number there, so I'm not, not completely sure whether that's a five or if that's a three. 
And this immediately brings problems because this data is actually labeled. So every one of these examples, you'll see, so e each, each number is an example. You can see that it's been inverted from maybe somebody written pen on white paper and um, it's been inverted and then um, reduced to a fixed pixel size and then centered as well. And the first thing that we can see is we're already not sure whether that's a three or a five. And so if somebody's gone through and labeled this data as being a three or a five, but I'm not convinced that that's actually correct. So we're giving our algorithm potentially dodgy data already. So bear that in mind whenever you're trying to train data that your, your label data might not be right in the first place because it's usually, it's usually labeled by, by humans. Um, so what we then do with each example is we feed it into an input layer. So I'm, I'm trying to stay away from the, the term neural network, although I've mentioned it a couple of times, because that it's been around since the 80s, but it, it, it sounds complicated, but it's really not. All a neural network is, you have a, a node where some data goes in, and then you have, um, you have links to a, a next subset of nodes, and those, all those links all have weights. That, it's as simple as that. All we do is we alter the weights within the, the, the network in order to perform a task. So I'll, I'll try and refrain from using that terminology. So our, our input layer is usually the same size as the size of the data. So here we've got may maybe 10 by 10 pixels. So we've got 100 inputs. We have one input for each pixel. We then pass that data through to uh, what's known as a hidden layer. And we call it a hidden layer basically because it's not an input or an output. It's something in the middle. It's not directly observable. Um, and the way in which they're connected is with a, a weight. And during the training process, those weights could be you know, completely removed by setting it to zero or you know, completely kept by setting it to a one. And that's all the training process is doing. Um, so what's really great at this point is that those weights actually, they combine in the next layer. So you might have learned that the weights that have been learned for that one particular neuron in the hidden layer can actually be treated as like a feature. This is, uh, this is the beginnings of a concept. So it's saying that given that one neuron, that one item in the hidden layer there, that has, a, uh, that has certain weights on each of the input pixels. Um, so if we, if, if, if we were to make that the output layer there, we could imagine that if that was the, the output layer for the number one, the weights would represent a shape that looks something like the number one. Generally, in hidden layers, you have multiple hidden layers, so you're trying to get the algorithm to learn these small steps, these small increments of, uh, of, um, of concept. And what we can actually do is to say that for, for that one hidden layer, we can go back and say, what does the input layer have to look like in order to fully activate that one neuron, and only that one neuron? So this is an example of that hidden feature layer here. And it might look a bit abstract, but you, you can just about start to make out that it's starting to learn this kind of ghostly images of numbers in there. And that's because it's starting to learn some of these concepts. If you were to use a number of hidden layers and say, you know, don't, don't try and learn the number all in one go, it might come up with features that are like uh, edges, maybe. It could learn the, the edge of the stick of a seven, or maybe it can start to learn some curves of a nine or something like that. And these are the hidden features that are in the middle of all these, these networks. So then finally, we produce an output layer, which usually amounts to the number of uh, possible classifications that we want to make. So for our output layer, we would have 10. We would have 0 to 9. And each one of those nodes would, would represent a number. And at the output layer, if we were to actually put one of these examples in, you'd never get 100%. You always get this. Um, the, it, the, we were talking earlier about how they're, they're not deterministic. But you kind of, they are deterministic in the sense that they have fixed weights, so you can follow the path of those weights through the data. However, we're never quite sure, like going back to that previous example, we're never quite sure whether it's a five or a three. So we're gonna, the algorithm will probably decide that I'm 50% sure that it's a five, but there's a 40% chance there could be a three. So all of the numbers that are generated, uh, basically the, the, the classification is made by picking the highest of those numbers. So in this case, would say that the five is the classification for this example because that had the highest value at the output. Um, 
But what's really cool as well is that we can actually, rather than um, try and tell it to classify the objects by only having 10 outputs, we can actually produce the same number of outputs and inputs and say, ask the algorithm, please try and reconstruct the image based upon your hidden you know, concepts and representations. So what we can do here is, uh, given a certain output, please reduce, reproduce that input, and then we could do some comparison to see how well it's performed. So this is an example of what a reconstruction actually looks like. And if I just flick backwards or forwards between what was real, what was the real input, and what was the learned concepts about that, you can kind of see that the learned concepts are kind of like a drunk, blurred version of the real number. Um, and that's because they're kind of learning the, the, what the most likely look is for that particular number. And, and what's really interesting is in the real data, we, we weren't sure whether that's three or a five. But if you look at the drunk version, it actually looks a little bit more than a five. And this is saying that the algorithm has decided, or, well, but it's probably been labeled as a five. So the, so the algorithm has, has learned that those features as a five. So when you try and reconstruct it, it looks more like a five. And then finally, we talked about dimensionality reduction. So what we can do is take that high dimensional output. So in this case, we had 10 discrete classes from 0 to 9. And we can flatten them in space. So we don't have 10 dimensions to plot all our data. So we can't, we can't plot the 50% of the 5, the 30% of the 4, the 20% of the 3, and so on and so on, all on a graph, because we don't have that many dimensions. So what we can do is flatten all of that into two dimensions. And this is what this process is here. And what it shows you is how well the data are clustering together. So we can see, if I have to stand very close to my screen, I can see that the number sevens at the bottom are quite well clustered. Uh, the number of eights are OK in the top left. Um, but with then we've also got some very strange features. Like, uh, So let's take the five and the three example. You see the fives in the orange in the middle. They're pretty well mixed with the, uh, uh, the three. And that's kind of because there must be quite a lot of examples that look like a 5 or look like a 3, so they're quite well mixed. So that means to actually perform the classification, the algorithm is going to have to work really hard to try and you know, pull those apart. So this is what you would generally do on the output, is you would, you would try and visualize the data in such a way that we, as humans, can, can understand it. And that could be in 2D or in 3D. OK, so hopefully that, that section kind of introduced you to to deep learning and some of the ideas and some of the terminology. So when I come to some of the financial demos, um, this they, they should be much easier to, to understand. So first example is a, a, a traditional example using uh, a, a rules-based approach. And in this case, we, we're being a little bit fancy. We're using a graph database. Um, typically, graph data databases aren't used as much as we'd like, but they, they do perform really well in a, in a fraud-based scenario. So just quickly recap, if you don't know, a graph database is a, another NoSQL database, um, but its power really is the description of the data. So the data can only ever be either a node or a relationship. A node is like a thing or a noun, um, whereas a relationship is a, is a link or a relationship or a, or a verb that basically connects two concepts together. Um, and the, the, the key selling point really is that sometimes you've got data that is just better described in a graph-like structure. So for example, when we're talking about fraud and, uh, and finance and stuff, you've got the concepts of people and accounts, and those people and accounts are all linked to different things. They're linked to an address, they're linked to a, a current account, and so on. So for example, we've got the traditional, um, you, the, uh, traditional <coughs> social media use case where We've got Bob's, is Bob is friends with Jane. Um, we've got a chair contained within a room. Jane bought a book, and so on. But the real power is that once you've modeled it in this way, you can perform complex queries that you wouldn't be able to do in a traditional relational database. So when you wanted to do, so to go back to the social media example again, when you wanted to do, like, who is friends with my friend, you have to do some crazy joins with your SQL in order to get that to work. With a graph database, you can just hop can just hop through the graph. And it makes it really, really fast. Um, so in a fraud situation, we might model our data something like this. We might have an account holder in the middle, and they have relationships with phone numbers or national insurance numbers, things like that. 
And then we can perform queries on that if we would like to. But when you start viewing that in detail and actually viewing how these connections are connecting things together, interesting patterns start to come out. And especially if you're visualizing it in this way as well, it's much easier to visualize data in this way than it is in a table, for example. Um, so in this example, we've got three account holders in red. I think they're red. Yep, they're red. And uh, they're linked in various different ways. We've got uh, all three of them are sharing the same address. So ooh, that could be dodgy. I actually had a, a person in another talk, excuse me, that I, I, I was suggesting that, oh, three people sharing the same address, that could be dodgy. And, and she was like, no, 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 no. When thousands of people are sharing the same address, then it's dodgy. Three is fine, don't worry about it. So I'm like, okay. So but we could set up a rule there to, um, to, to say, you know, how many uh, people are using the same address. And you could do that in a traditional database. But where the power really comes in is when you start linking these, th these things together and searching for these larger rings and groups within the data. So if we imagine that directly two people aren't sharing the same national insurance number, for example, which is illegal in the UK, um, maybe there's a, a third party which is linking these national insurance numbers together. So you actually start to form these rings within the data, which are kind of not, not natural. There shouldn't really be rings in the data. And graph databases are really good at viewing and spotting these rings. So that's the kind of technology that would exist in the wild today if we were asked to, to perform a, uh, a, a job like this. But where we're really interested in is, is bringing some machine learning techniques to some of these ideas. So the, the, the first idea I had was um, quite a typical one, really, and that's why, I, uh, <laughs> that's why I did it, because it was quite easy to do. Um, but basically, if we could use vocal fingerprints for origination, it would just solve just the, the main reasons really are it would save um, the user a significant amount of time. The user uh, experience would, would you know, be huge, hugely improved, not having to wait on the phone for 20 minutes just because some stupid automated system took you to the wrong place. Um, so if we can use the person's voice as a, a form of authentication, origination, then uh, we'll be able to save time, be able to save machines, and <laughs> be able to save the the power of people on the other end of the phone. So to do this, what we'd have to do is to record the customer's voice, we then pre-process the data in some way to, to clean it up and put it in a format that's, that's uh, capable of being put into uh, uh, an algorithm. In this case, we would train a deep learning model, but it could be any algorithm. And then we'd store that fingerprint for future verification. In the online scenario, so once you've got that set up, the user would come on, you'd re-record his voice again, maybe against the preset phrase, maybe against a new phrase, um, and then you'd compare that result to the fingerprint. And that would prove whether that person is you know, really who they say they are. So this is uh, the pre-processing stage in action. So this is a bit of signal processing, which is converting the, the time signature of the, the audio file into frequency, into the frequency domain. So what you're seeing there is a plot of the frequency components versus time. So red is strong, and that green bluey color is, is weak. So it's saying that you, know, you can see the, the gaps in between the data there are kind of where they've paused to, to say the words. And I think if, we're, if it works, don't ask me to carry it farther. Yeah. So this is some example data that I used Don't in my ask learning. Me to carry an oily rag like that. And this is three examples of three people saying the same phrase. Don't ask me to carry an oily rag like that. Don't ask me what that phrase actually means. I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, but anyway, you, you can tell yourself that those three voices sounded sometimes a little bit different, but in that last example, completely different. And what we're trying to do is to, to make the deep learning think the same. OK. Um, so once we've put it into our deep learning model, we've done the training, and we've produced an output. Our output in this case is between these three different people, so you could have three outputs. And then again, we've compressed that. We've squashed that under the screen into two dimensions. And this is a plot that shows how close all of those voices were between. So we've got a couple of different points in there. And the, the different colors there, the Bob, Steve, and Dave, they correspond to the three different examples, the three different people giving the examples, sorry. And each individual point is a specific phrase that they said. So we had uh, 10, 10 different phrases that they said. And you can see that all of these examples are clustering together quite well. So if we then took another, um, the, the same people, but using uh, a different spoken example, so not the same examples, how would that perform on the new data? 
So um, I think if we go again. She had to start to increase the launch point around here. So the top line there in the results, that was the, the raw result, the raw output of those three neurons um, for, for that file. And it's saying that one of the neurons had 0 0.98, another one 0 0.1, another one 0, or 0 0.1 as well. And that's saying that, you know, Bob, definitely, pretty sure, 98% sure that that was definitely Bob. She had your dark suit from greasy wash water all the year. There you go, 97% chance that was Steve. She had your dark suit in greasy wash water all year. And 96% it was Dave. Um, so that was that example. Um, quite a simple example in the sense that it only used a very small data set, but it's, you know, it's instructive. Um, and it kind of points towards things that we could do in the future, given much more data. I mean, like every phone call we pick up these days, there's always a, we are recording your voice for verification and training purposes. So there must be huge, vast databases of people's voices out there. OK, so next example, decision trees. Um, so this is an example of decision tree that we showed earlier on. And uh, this is predicting mortgage default. So amazingly, um, two banks, two, two, sorry, two mortgage providers in the US went bust, as, as usual, of, of, of course, and uh, were bailed out by the US taxpayer, so the owned by the U US government. So Freddie, Ma Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, um, and as part of their I don't know, as, as part of their reprisal, basically, a slap on the wrist, the, uh, the government forced them to release lots of their data to the public. And amazingly, they, uh, they publicized um, a whole data set of mortgage applications and also historical accounts of what happened to those mortgage applications. So you can say that um, they, they told us whether that person then defaulted in the future. Um, so the, the, the task here is given some Given some, uh, oh dear, I'm running over time, I'll have to speed up. Given some data, um, is it possible to predict whether that person is going to default? So the first, the first problem is the whole data cleaning problem. Like we saw in the previous talk, um, it, it, that's the vast majority of time is spent cleaning data. Um, I'll go skip over that. So if we were to flatten all of the data that was recovered into a, an image before we put it through the algorithm, this is kind of what it looks like. It's very intermingled and mixed can't quite understand what's going on. So a decision tree is, is uh, learning all of these rules. And based upon the outcome of those rules, it's whether yes, the person defaulted, no, they didn't default. So we had uh, uh, approximately 20,000 samples total, 50-50 split, um, a random forest classifier. So it's a, a, a type of decision tree algorithm, but is better, uh, does not overfit as, as much. Uh, only 11 input features. So the, the main problem here is I don't actually think we've got enough data to, to do a really good job, but we'll see what we can do. Um, the one great thing about decision trees is that it actually gives you a, a measure of importance for all of those variables. So here we've got the variables that were uh, inputted to the algorithm at the bottom, and it shows the respective um, uh, importance of those variables uh, on the on the left hand side so you can see actually the credit score is in second place so I'm not sure that the credit reference agencies would be too happy that you know they could only explain 0.25 of the data so 25 percent of the data could only be explained by uh, uh, the credit score alone so not not a great result for them and actually the most important um, measure was the HPI origination which was the house price index at origination for that local area so this is saying that a person who took out a mortgage in a very local area is very dependent on the prices within that area as to whether they're going to default or not and this is kind of a typical really in the US you can see like vast tracts of like places like Detroit that uh, you know as soon as some of the jobs left everybody just lost their jobs and the whole house price area then crashed and then people couldn't afford to sell because they couldn't sell it um, so that's kind of why that's so important interesting result and then final example, I'm having to move rather quickly here because I've only got two minutes left, but is it possible to take that data and try and see whether there's something strange going on with in the data? So basically, this is an unlabeled example. We're not telling it what to learn here. So how do we do that? Well, there's a, a, a deep learning technique called uh, uh, an autoencoder, which basically it takes the inputs, and it restricts the number of hidden neurons to only a few concepts. He's saying you've really got to pick and choose what data you use and generate some concepts that are really quite strict. And then we try and reproduce the output again. And we're comparing the output against the input. 
um, as a, a measure of how well we've done. So basically, those restrictions in the middle, maybe only two neurons, you know, yes and no, something like that. Is that possible to reconstruct the data? So we can do that. So it's the same data as before. Uh, slightly, it's a different random sample, so it might look slightly different. We've got an input layer, a number of hidden layers that are compressing the data down into smaller and smaller neurons, and then we're reconstructing again back to the input layer and doing a comparison to see how well we did. But what we can do then is plot in 2 or 3D one of those hidden layers to actually view those concepts and what we've learned. And finally, this is the result of that process. On the left-hand side, we've got a 2D representation, and you can start to see there's actually some structure within that data. Um, so the most generally, you can see that the, the people that defaulted, uh, the, the trues on that graph are on the, on the left-hand side, and uh, the people that didn't default are on the right-hand side. And within there, if you look on the right-hand side, there's a couple of orange dots, and that's saying that the vast majority of people in there didn't default, but one or two people did. Now, an analyst might start to ask why, so it could be something quite innocent, you know, maybe the person lost his high-powered job, um, went to prison, something like that. But it's kind of indicative that something else is going on. And this is where the analyst would come in and start investigating that data. So these are completely unlabeled, and the algorithm has absolutely no idea what it means. And it still takes a human to do some analysis and to do some investigation to figure out what has happened. But these kinds of tools lead the analyst in the right direction, as opposed to just taking a random sample. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we've got a 3D representation of the same data. And this is where it becomes really, really powerful. You can imagine, like, if you could get that graph and you can, like, look into it and, and move it and, t and turn it around. And you can start to see clusters in 3D space. And that's when it starts to become immersive. And given enough time, it takes, it takes a certain amount of time for any analyst to analyze data. But given enough time, they will be able to learn to see patterns within that data, which will help them to investigate things that they haven't seen before. And I think I better stop there because I've completely run out of time. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Cheers.